One of them is now a fugitive, while the other one is still within the jail walls. As soon as Charles Ng gets released from prison, him and Leonard Lake will put their plan into action. Their operation resulted in 12 confirmed victims, although it was speculated that there were 25. The lifestyles that brought these two individuals together will in the end be the cause of their demise. This is the second part of the story of Charles Ng and Leonard Lake. Another one? Another one bites the dust? Listen, the legend says every time a Scorpio dies, 10 couples stop doing it around Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Wow, you look like actual caca today. Wow, okay. The girl in the back has fired her shorts. We are all a family here, okay? A girl just showered. A girl doesn't care about beauty, clearly. A girl is here with her priorities on telling the goddamn story of the day. I read this thing on TikTok, but people don't like me then in the way you guys do. Who likes me? You think you have fans? She's on fire today. She's on fire. So I ran this idea on TikTok that I thought I will run here as well. Listen to me. I believe I found a gap in the market when it comes to entertainment industry slash law. What if, hear me out, there needs to be obviously logistically introduction of certain articles within the law for this to happen. So, what if all of these influencers, TikTokers, YouTubers that are fighting one another for money, for their own profit, for entertainment purposes, what if they were to go into prison when these people, the lowest of the low people or the death row people who have been convicted for crimes against children, and instead they go into the prison, cameras on, lights on, surprise bitch you getting beaten today and they never know when it's gonna happen because their victims didn't know that that's gonna be the last day that they live on this planet so they deserve it the karma is being served and all of the money that is collected from these fights goes to the victims families goes to their trust something good happening in the world it needs to be fit into law mm, loopholes gotta be found gotta be found because listen, that's 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 how we serve karma in my Scorpio mind. That's how karma is served. Speaking of Scorpio minds, we finalized the saga today of one Scorpio mind and one I don't know what he was Christmas child birth mind. I don't know what his zodiac sign was. I truly am not into horoscopes. I just <laughs> Leonard Lake speaks for me sometimes. Okay because I kind of understand certain characteristics that he has, and as such, I hate that these two went into crime. Truly, the two people that we are finishing off speaking about today could not have been criminals, let alone serial killers. They could have actually gone and done something good with their life, but no. No. And for those exact reasons, we have this series. The series is called Gone Bad. Maya is the name. Gone Bad is the game of the day. It is the series where I sit on this very channel. You're right here, you're right here. Make sure you like and subscribe if you're ready for the meltdowns for the future. I sit on my fat ass and I tell you a story about people that have led normal lives. They have led pretty basic, pretty like, meh, okay lives, you know, the grind, the nine to five, and then one day, boom, they just decided, I'm switching to crime. <laughs> like this boring life. I'm switching to crime. And we talk about how these switches happen. Why did they happen? Just like, truly, why? Just sit on the couch and chill. That is the moral of the story. So let us conclude the saga of Leonard Lake and Charles motherfucking Ng. And so many victims, so many people that they have killed. Which also calls for a disclaimer. The topic of the day includes the theme of sexual violence and sadism. Viewer discretion is very much so advised. Which also means if you are a child, get off my channel. Just, just in general, you know, what would your mom say? What would your mother say if they knew what you were watching? Okay, it's time to get dive into the story. Today, instead of you calling kids on the internet out, if you haven't listened to part one, I would definitely recommend listening to that one first. But let me give you a quick recap. So, first came to this earth Leonard Lake in 1945, and as a child he did display a couple of red flags. 
he was very much into killing small animals like mice and before killing them he would create these fantasy worlds for them. Is that a YouTube ad? Great timing. Love it. And we move on. He also has expressed huge interest in photography. And ever since his family brought him the camera, he was also taking snaps of his half-sisters. And the big thing that happened in his childhood was that his mom kind of abandoned him and left him behind while taking two of his siblings in order to attempt to salvage her marriage with his father, and then she kind of remarried. And Leonard stayed with his family. At an early... And Leonard stayed with his family. When he was in his early teenage years, Leonard read this book called The Collector. In this book, this guy went from collecting butterflies to looking for a perfect woman to kidnap and keep her as a sex slave, his perfect Miranda. And that and already sort of these survivalist ideologies kind of collided in Leonard's head. And he really wanted to conduct Operation Miranda, which would technically be him keeping women, kidnapping women and keeping them in this bunker that he would already prepare for the end of the world. And these women would comply to all of his wishes. Then, in 1965, Charles Ng came to this world, and he was born in China. He was heavily impressionable by Bruce Lee movies, by martial arts, and just in general different fighting techniques. From the early childhood, he kind of had multiple different addictions that would all showcase this time when he was in Marine Corps, when he moved to the US, and he designated this robbery of the arms, of the weapons in the military, and this is what in the end would lead him to being imprisoned. So, when we left the two of them off, Leonard Lake was looking for a perfect follower, somebody who would help him build this bunker and help him find his Mirandas. By this point, Charles Ng was corresponding with Lake from prison, and Lake was also a fugitive on different robbery charges. What nobody knew was that Lake, at this point, had already killed two people, his brother and his best friend, and was finally building this bunker in order to put his plan into action. We left it off with Leonard sitting in that ugly-ass chair, saying exactly what he plans to do, what a perfect Miranda would be for him, and talking about the outline of this bunker and the purpose that it would have. And now, if you remember, he was looking for people to conduct this work, to actually do the hard work for him, to build this bunker from the ground, because he didn't really know. He just had, like, a vision, as always, in this life. This is also why this place is going to look so terrifying and ugly, because he always had a vision, but never knew how to actually, like, do the hard work. And just like with every single story that I told you in the first part there, Every single interaction in Leonard's life is kind of, like, worth mentioning just because certain bits and pieces of information that are, like, prevalent to his psyche come out. So, he hired this guy, Randy, to work on this bunker. This is the end of 1983, beginning of 1984. And at these points, Leonard is, as I mentioned, compulsively journaling. Every single thought that he has, he has to put it to paper, or he has to sit in front of a camera and tell the force to the public, which kind of makes him sound like YouTubers. Cool, you see, Leonard could have had other jobs, could have been a storyteller. YouTube didn't exist literally until 2005. He could have found the means move on with the story. As he's doing that, another prevalent thing in Leonard's life is that he will start using identities of his victims, because he's using their social security numbers already to claim, like, the benefits, so why not use their names as well? So, when Randy would meet Leonard Lake, he would meet him as Charles Gunner, which was his best friend's name. And with Randy, there was this situation where Leonard suspected that Randy stole from him. So, he actually went into Randy's house 
with a camera, with a tripod, and he, Leonard, conducted what he thought as an interrogation, where he got Randy to actually confess to him that he stole from him, and then he found, like, some evidence inside of his house as well. And then, in the end, it would end up that Randy stole from him because his mom was addicted to crack. It doesn't matter for much in this story, but it tells you where Leonard was psychologically at this point, that he was compulsive taping everything, really paranoid about certain people, about literally everybody in his life. And as I mentioned in the first part, he has had this kind of relationship with debts and I owe you one, because here he forgave Randy. He will just say to Randy, like, you'll pay up by doing even more work on the ranch. You'll just pay up for what you stole from me. So just like with Charles Ng, just like with every single person in his life, Leonard will always come to collect his debts and he will also hold it over people, sort of like as a way to manipulate them, as a way to show his dominance and to get them to be more in a role of a follower. Another interesting account that came from Randy, from this worker on his bunker, would be how he saw the relationship between Leonard and Cricket. If you remember, by this point, Cricket and Leonard were divorced. But this will heavily, for later purposes, be relevant in order to show how much Cricket was actually involved. Or maybe not, but she, she was kind of involved. Because Cricket, by this time, would be showing up on ranch and she would be bringing these girls. Cricket would be bringing these girls along who would be age 16, 17 to this cabin so that they can take pictures of them. And Randy realized that this camera was actually hidden so that the girls didn't even know that they were being recorded. The new year, the beginning of 1984, saw some real progress on this bunker and really kind of heated up Leonard's search for Miranda. He would write about this in his journals. He would be saying that this company, the women that he found himself or that Cricket brought, were great, but while he enjoys their company, he doesn't want an independent guest or a girlfriend around for too long or too often. He enjoys quiet, not having to entertain or clean up after others. People around seem to get in the way, get into things, attempt to change things. When Miranda arrives, she'll be on a strictly helpmate basis. She'll be around when I need help, do what she's told, and go to her room when I'm finished with her. He was of an opinion that God made women for cooking, housework, and sex, and then when they're done doing that, well, then they should retreat to their room and leave men in peace, leave men alone. And he would often repeat in his diaries, if you love something, let it go. If it doesn't come back to you, it was never yours to begin with. No, he didn't start that dumb saying. He ended that, if it doesn't come back to you, with you hunt it down and you kill it. Yeah, a, a bit of a different ending there. Just as the bunker was about ready, in June 1984, Charles Ng will end up being released from prison after spending 26 months in there. And just to really make sure that you understand this, he spent 26 months in prison. That was 26 months that they could have checked his documents and realized that they were fake, that this man was never born in the US. He could have been deported at any of these points. And yet again, none of this would have happened. But no, the system failed victims in the story again and again. Charles will not go straight to Lake, though, because Lake wasn't Charles Ng's only correspondent. You see, Charles Ng kind of had a bit of mommy issues, you could really say, because he started pen paling this woman who was... She could have been his mom, maybe, if she was like a teenage pregnancy. She was in her 40s, okay? <laughs> and all of the people in their 40s, like, typing, like, we are not this old, Maya. I get you. But listen, I'm just trying to get into Charles's mind here as much as I got into Leonard's and I am not succeeding, so I'm just trying to make it make sense because he's in his early 20s and clearly the only relationship that we know about in Charles Ng's life 
is this pen pal relationship that ending up in sort of something once he left prison when he was like 23, 4 of age with this woman called Sally. I won't go too much into detail because, first of all, in this book Sally has about two pages, so there's not that much detail to begin with, but second, because this story truly disgusts me. So basically, Sally and him were like pen pals in prison, and then he went out, he stayed in another man's flat house. Basically, this man was in the Marines with Charles, and this is where he met Sally in person and they couldn't resist one another so they booked a motel and then they did it for about two hours and Ing didn't have sex with a girl in about two years apparently. We don't know anything about Ing's life to, to begin with. We just know about his childhood and that's about it. That's why I can't understand the man. I can't fully understand his actions. But hey, they do it, but then they realize, like, she cares about him as a mother. She doesn't say that. That's heavily my speculations. But yeah, she just cares about him, but not as a, you know, potential relationship. And she gets out of that situation. Thank fuck. And in July, Cricket picks up Charles Ng from San Francisco airport. And he goes back to meet with his one and only love, with his one and only best friend, Leonard Lake. By this point, Leonard has already settled in this woodland area near Wilseyville in Calaveras County. And this bunker next to his cabin was already almost formed, piled with illegal weapons inside and some stolen video equipment. And this is truly when Leonard 100% commits himself to hunting. But not hunting animals, deer in the wild. No, Leonard Lake was hunting humans. And years after different behavior analysts, different psychologists will analyze Leonard Lake and wonder how, what would draw women to him. Like, he wasn't this super attractive guy. He could, as we learned in part one, switch his charm on and off. He knew how to manipulate women and not show his true colors until it was too late. Sometimes Cricket was the one talking, sometimes Cricket was the one bringing women to the table. But what a lot of experts have said here is that it wasn't even so much about the charm or the lack thereof. It was that people could spot danger when it comes to Leonard Lake. And that women were drawn to him because of this sense of danger, because they found him irresistible. <laughs> Leather like irresistible, you know. <laughs> and that women were drawn to him because of this sense of danger, because they found it exciting, because that's what they found irresistible. So it wasn't the man, it was more like who he represented that women would find attractive. After Cricket brought Charles from the airport, the two of them sat down and spoke about their marine days, spoke about his time in prison, and probably spoke about the future plans and what they envisioned for this cabin and this bunker that they had been building. Leonard's journal entries would become scarce. In fact, he actually will have an entry about teaching Charles how to drive, and then the entries would just fully stop for about two months. So let's speak about what wasn't in Leonard Lake's journals. Well, at first, he was helping his friend Charles find a place to live. So he placed him with his half-sister Janet at first, and he was representing Charles as Mike Kimoto to everybody. And Charles had the ID to show it. He already nicked this ID out of the wallet of somebody just randomly on the street. But then, after living with Janet, he decided like he wants to live in the flat on his own. So he moved to this 19th Avenue, into this small apartment complex. And this flat would only be like half a mile from where Leonard was living at the time. Then Charles had to find a job. So he just went down the road to the main street and applied to this storage company that was called Dennis Moving Company. Charles would be working in this large warehouse, loading, unloading, rearranging boxes, different crates, furniture, and just like other items that people would place in company's care. 
But now here is where they had a couple of major dilemmas. As you probably remember, although there are so many details in part one, Leonard was still driving the truck that belonged to his best friend that he killed and his wife, Wiki. So he was like, okay, maybe this isn't like the smartest idea. Yes, I'm going around and Charles Gunner, but what if somebody figures out that I'm not Charles Gunner? So he started off representing himself as Leonard Blake. Super undercover, amazing skills, top-notch FBI undercover man here. And Charles was kind of like also in the dilemma, like, should I go under this Mike Kimotas guy? I mean, he is alive, like, I never actually killed him. Or should we maybe both start stealing other people's identities? And then, you know, every couple of months, we have a different name to show for it. And when they have this discussion, Leonard says, well, yeah, then I'm gonna drive this van close to, like, Vicky's house so that she kind of notices it there. I don't have to ever, like, explain the situation. And then I need to be on the lookout for different modes of transportation. I need to try and steal other people's cars. And that's where a couple of things, like, clicked in their brains. They need other people's identities. And they also need different modes of transportation. And, well, those victims can't really survive those ordeals. And this is where we come to the core of this story. Because 90% of the story of Leonard Lake and Charles Ng isn't about Operation Miranda. It's about the preparation for it. What I mean by this is if we believe that they have had 25 victims, we know only for sure that two of them were his Mirandas because of the recordings that we'll speak about later, which means that 23 of them died for a completely different purpose. They either died as the result of the two of them needing to have a different identity, or the two of them needing video equipment supplies, or certain car supplies to transport themselves, or they died because of Leonard's desperate fixation to find a perfect Miranda. And now, if you remember in the intro how I said that their lifestyles will, in the end, lead to their demise, this is exactly what I meant. His fixation on Miranda will lead Leonard Lake to his demise, and that is also because he didn't notice how Charles's Ing psychology didn't really fit into his. By this point, Charles Ing was a petty thief. He again went back from prison, went out from prison, rather, and resorted to these small thefts, these small robberies. And sometimes he would get caught for them. So he would end up back in jail. And every single time, Leonard Lake would go in and pay the bail, pay the bail up for him and release him from prison. And this is when he would go back to his journaling and write, met Charlie, performed op, met resistance for the first time, unsuccessful in obtaining credit cards or bank codes, drove to country for completion, cancelled Charlie's running debt to me. So as creepy as this sounds, we never know from Leonard's journal entries what part Charlie played in these pre-operations? Well, Leonard would still be calling them operations, but what part he really played here? Like, how was he cancelling his own debts? But what I'm really trying to point out is that he wasn't noticing this full-blown addiction by this point that might ruin his whole operation. And he also wasn't noticing and reflecting internally to spot how his own fixation might have some holes to it. As both of them are completely void of any self-reflection, they begin their crime spree in July of 1984. This is when they spotted an ad for some video equipment in the papers, and the ad was posted by a man called Harvey Dobbs. So, I'm not sure what kind of conversations Ing and Lake had here, but Ing decided to just knock on the door and go sort of like inspect this video equipment and see if he would like to purchase it. And at this point, when Ing went to knock on that door, only Harvey's wife Deborah was inside with a young child. Harvey Dubs was 29 years at the time, and he worked for this company called Petrographics. 
and they only lived a couple of streets away from where Ing was based at the time. At the time of Charles's knock on the door, Deborah was talking to one of her best friends, and this is what she would be doing multiple times a day, around 5.45 p.m. Deborah would be saying to this friend how Harvey started this business venture called Video Dubs, where he would professionally make video recordings of weddings, christenings, other events, and on his days off, when he wasn't recording, he started renting out this expensive equipment that he used. This phone call would end with Deborah saying that somebody's at the door, probably the person interested in borrowing this equipment. Not long after this happened, the next door neighbor spotted this Asian man with really thick glasses, kind of like carrying this suitcase that looked really hefty, coming out from the Dubs' apartment and just putting it into their own car and then driving away. So she kind of gets those spikely, tangly feelings like something seems off, like I have never seen this person why are they taking a suitcase out of their flat, like something seems off. But she doesn't report it at the time. It would be only the next day when Harvey doesn't show up for work that his boss is like, no, he literally lives for this job, like this is the job of his dreams that he reports it to the police. By this point, though, in the early morning the next day, another neighbor spotted a similarly-looking Asian man coming out of the flat, carrying, like, two duffel bags that looked packed with something. And again, he's just like, who is this person? But he doesn't make the connection. The police won't actually connect this case to these two for months, but they would have a theory about how they would be doing it in the end, once they connect the dots, because the Dubs family won't be the only family that would be claimed victims to Lake and Ing. So, this woman, this detective, Irene Broom, was on the case kind of nine months after this, and her theory about how they would attack families would be that, you know, it would always be, like, a reliable reason for one of them to actually come to the home, whether it would be an ad in the papers or something else. So, in this case, it was renting of the video equipment. As soon as one would knock on the door and the victim, in this case, Deborah, opened the door and she would shut it after he would be in the house, he would probably grab the child off of her immediately and tell her to comply. And at this point, Leonard Lake would probably join the party or just on the premise of a perpetrator hurting their baby, Deborah would comply and the father would still be at work. The father still wouldn't be at home, which would be crucial. So, they would manage to subdue the mother holding the child's life over their head and then, when the father would come, they would probably zip-tie the father as well. Now, both of them would be in the house, and the detective suspected that the child probably wouldn't be leaving that house alive, because somebody would be hearing the child's cries. When it comes to this case, there are lots of, like, myths and legends that make it sound even worse than it actually is. So, you kind of see these things in a lot of different sources, but a lot of them do sound quite monstrous, which both of these individuals already were. So, I am not sure whether they're facts or whether they are just literally, like, those stories that have been told for so long that they kind of go into history. Because from what I read from the book, from all of the sources online, there were two recordings that went into court, and this wasn't one of them. On the recordings, they wouldn't showcase the whole family. They would only showcase the torture of two of the women. And again, Deborah wasn't one of them. That doesn't mean that those recordings don't exist, that they're not somewhere underground, that these things didn't happen. But why I'm saying this is because of what is said that they have done to the children. So, according to plenty of sources, none of which is confirmed, it is said that Leonard, in some of the recordings, or after they would transport the family to their bunker, to their cabin, would torture both parents on the side and then 
in the end, when they would want to get rid of them, that Leonard would kind of like hold the child in between his legs and would kill the child by sort of like screwing the child's head around. And that is probably the most gruesome fact that I have ever like said in life, but I'm not sure that it happened because of just thinking logistically, I don't think that these children of these families left that house alive in the first place. Their next two victims from October and November 1984 will be the ones that they use to upgrade on their vehicles. So when Randy Jacobson disappeared in October, they possibly went to meet one or the other. We don't know whether they went to meet Charles or Leonard. But this is where a pattern starts forming. Because Leonard Lake and Charles Ing, probably Lake here because of the manipulation techniques, would either get their victims to write the letters to their families, or in some cases it wasn't really clear whether they would be the ones writing them. And in certain cases, those letters would be coming from a typewriter that later they would manage to connect to the one that they found inside of the bunker. And they would do this for multiple different evil reasons, but the most prevalent one being for the family to think that their loved ones are still alive and not reported to the police. So, in the case of Randy Jacobson, who was kind of like a hippie, his girlfriend said that he did disappear on her before. So, this is why she didn't report it to the police. So, she waited for about three days, and just as she was about to do it, well, she received this note. Her roommate told her there's a letter from Randy. And then looking at that letter, here it was handwritten, so she said she couldn't really process whether it was just like shaky handwriting or whether it was just Randy writing like under the rest. But apparently Randy wrote that he is gonna be coming home just to pick up his clothes, but he moved with this guy Steve to San Jose for this big weed operation. And Maisha, his girlfriend, was just like, this doesn't make sense any sense. But still, it made her sort of not report it to the police for the next couple of days, and by that point, it was too late. In November that same year, 39-old Paul Costner would disappear from San Francisco, and he also advertised a used Honda for sale in the papers. He also lived with his fiance, and he kind of said, like, this potential buyer seems a bit weird, but he will return by 8 p.m. to watch a TV show. But Paul Costner was never seen again. With Leonard constantly having in the back of his mind this Miranda project and scouting for a perfect Miranda, these kills were probably just being seen as a collateral damage. So, this is when they decide to rent an apartment in what was called the Pink Palace. It was this apartment complex with plenty of women, but also it was in the slums. So, they kind of knew that in this part of town, the police won't take the disappearances of these women as seriously. This is where Leonard would introduce himself as this helpful neighbor. He would always try to, like, help them with, like, moving anything, or be there if they needed anything while he was actually scouting for victims. So there was this woman called Maurice that lived with her flatmate Cheryl Okoro on the ground floor, and immediately Leonard spotted both of them, but he really got fixated on the friend Cheryl Okoro. Next, Leonard would resort to his old tricks, and now under a fake identity, he would start chatting with two different neighbors, one called Camara and one called Maurice Rock. And with Maurice Rock, he kind of tried to poach him to convince his other neighbor, Camara to pose nude for him. And he was almost bait because Lake, again, was manipulative. He was sending him different joints as an inducement, telling him that he has a ranch in the mountains where he could pick all the marijuana that he needs. In the end, Camara would refuse to pose for Leonard, but Maurice accepted the job, and he has never been seen again. Cheryl Okoro was 26 at the time, and Maurice was only 38. 
Here we yet again aren't sure what exactly happened to them. Did they meet the same fate that the confirmed victims did on that farm? But what we know because of the documents that were found on Charles Ng and Leonard Lake once arrested, we would know that these would be their victims, we would know their names, and also with so many victims on their ranch, they would find just like partial bones in different stages of decomposition, but it would be speculated that a lot of their victims' bodies were just fed to these chicken that they held on this ranch. Charles, if you remember, Charles was really attached to a pet chicken as a child. What happened, Charles? What happened? Were you aware? Probably yes, because you were involved. I don't know why this part stuck with me when I heard it, but it did. Because it's just like, it all comes back to your freaking childhood. Was it like a fuck you moment to his parents? That now he is actually feeding this chicken? Like, were these people ever actually overthinking this as we are when we are analyzing them? Or were they just thinking about how they were to dispose of their victims in the most efficient way. Their next victim will be Donald Albert Giulietti, who was only 36 at the time, and he was a DJ at this radio station, and according to the friends and family, he was openly gay. So, on this occasion, in July 1984, he placed an ad in the papers offering oral sex for straight men. A reader would respond and would arrive at a residence that Giulietti shared with another roommate. And now the roommate kind of stepped aside, stepped in a different room to offer them privacy. But the next thing that they have heard were gunshots. So he obviously runs out of this room to check what is going on, and he gets shot himself. But he will survive, but Giulietti won't. And he would describe this Asian man who was lean at the time with, like, really thick prescription glasses fleeing the scene. We've got a bit of a pattern, if you ask me, because every single person of these crime scenes describes an Asian man, a Chinese man, thick prescription glasses, being shady as fuck. Just keep that in mind. Just remember those things, because they will become relevant at trial, because everybody describes a similar-looking person. Now, speaking of that particular Asian man seeing fleeing all of these crime scenes between 1984 and 85, what do you think he was like as a co-worker? Just, like, honest, honest question. Honest question. Wh what do you think? Do you think he was fun? Fun to be around? Of course not. Charles Ng would often be heard chanting things like no gun, no fun, and no kill, no frill, which is something that he did from his early marine days. But in the marine, people were like, yeah, this means commitment. Charles is super committed to this cause. But at work, at his storage company, that wasn't really seen as just, like, something acceptable or fun. It was probably creeping people out as hell, like, when he starts repeating this for, like, the 20th time of the day. Just imagine working with a guy in the canteen. He's like, no kill, no frill. He's like, I'm just trying to eat lunch, Charlie. Like. When that wouldn't be enough, Charles would sometimes say, Daddy dies, mommy cries, baby fries. Which is super eerie in itself, but it's kind of like extra eerie when you think about how they potentially killed the families. One Friday evening, his co-worker Cliff Peranto just left work to go and watch Super Bowl. And he was working the next day, so he wasn't, like, going super hard when it comes to booze. So, the next day, when he didn't show up for his shift, his colleagues started being worried, like, as if what happened. He never said that he was gonna call in sick and that he won't show up. A couple of days later, the co-workers would get this letter. Dennis, sorry to leave on such short notice, but a new job, place to live, and the honey came all at once. Please send my check for the last three days I worked and my W-2 to my new address below. Thanks, Cliff. As we know from the first parter and when we discussed the psychology of the two, when Charlie kills, it's more about just a means to an end. There is something that he gains out of it, even if it is just three days of somebody's pay. Whereas when Leonard kills, there's all of this manipulation. There's all of this 
sort of foreplay to it, what he does before he commits the kill. So on this occasion now, because his dumbass didn't realize that killing neighbors means that maybe those neighbors will need to be replaced, there were these neighbors sort of up the road that he has met, and this would be the Bond family. And they really started going on Leonard's nerves. Why? A completely reasonable explanation. So this family consisted of Lonnie, Brenda, and their kid, Lonnie Jr. And a completely reasonable explanation is that they didn't really respond well when Leonard offered for Brenda to model for him, she would reject his advances. She didn't want to model nude because she was already married with her child. Yeah, completely reasonable explanation that just would never sink in into Leonard's Lake's brain. And also, when their friends, when the Bond friends would come from San Diego, they would sometimes fire guns at targets in their yard. And this was angry Lake. This was angering him, this was going on his nerves, and he would just be sitting and seeding, because in Brenda, he would see a perfect Miranda. But Brenda won't be his next victim, because he would put that to the side as all of his focus will go into capturing and bringing to the bunker, this time as an alive victim, to finally convert into one of his sex slaves, a woman called Kathleen Allen. It's not really clear how he met Kathleen. Kathleen's boyfriend was in the Marine Corps, so maybe one or the other knew them from that context. But Kathleen also worked in a safe way close by, so in my opinion, he probably stalked her and would sort of sit in the parking lot observing women looking for a perfect Miranda. And she just fit the lifestyle that would make it easy for Leonard Lake to strike. Kathleen, affectionately called by everybody as Kathy, was one of those people that everybody described as strong, intelligent, somebody who would always bring the energy of the place up. Like, all of her friends said, like, if I was ever to be down, Kathleen would be the person that would ring up to, like, cheer me up. She was 18 at the time, and she was working at the Safeway supermarket, and she was on and off with her boyfriend, Mike Carroll, who was 23, and he kind of contributed to their expenses by working at this pizza place. Mike did have some run-ins with the law because he served some time on federal drug charges, and he did love Kathy, but even he knew that he had some violent urges at time, that manifested themselves in physical abuse. But Kathy would always look past those, and she would always justify them by him having a hard life that led him to selling drugs and then being in prison, that he was actually good at heart. In early spring 1985, the two of them moved into this motel until they could find a more permanent residence where they could move in together. And to Kathy, this looked as a sign that he's finally ready to settle down and plan their future together. So on April the 12th, when he didn't return to the motel, Kathy started worrying. She was really worried, like, why? What happened? Why did he just disappear? But she kind of sits on it until the next day. And this is when her colleagues say that she received, apparently, a message from Mike telling her that he is experiencing some issues in San Francisco and is seeking refuge near Lake Tahoe, sort of implying that he still might be in some legal trouble, that he still might be a fugitive, he still might be hiding something. And in this message, apparently Mike said if she could ask for some time off, he would get somebody to pick her up to bring her to Lake Tahoe to him. Kathy wanted to find out what is going on. She wanted to help her boyfriend out. So this day, her co-worker gave her her number to call if any issues, and she got into a car with a man who looked like he's balding, who looked like he's in his early 40s, white, and she got into a Honda, which was probably the Honda that he got from one of his victims, Paul Costner. That evening, her friend would report that they actually got a call from Kathy, and it seemed like she was still in a car, or they have made a stop to a location, and that she said she's in a car with Mike's friend, apparently, that is bringing her to Mike, and that he's a bit weird. 
and he is asking her if he can take pictures of her once they make it to the location. So this friend asks Kathy to make a call to them as soon as she makes it to this destination, and Kathy promised that she would. But a few hours later, she will find herself unable to phone anybody, because she will be sitting in a sofa in front of a camera with handcuffs tying her hands behind her back. From behind the camera, you could hear the voice of Leonard Lake saying, Mike owes us. He can't pay. Now we are going to give you a choice, Kathy. And this is probably the last choice that we are going to give you. You can go along with us. You can cooperate. You can do everything we tell you to do willingly. And in approximately 30 days, if you want a date to write on your calendar, the 15th of May, We will either drug you, blindfold you, or in some way or other make sure you don't know where you are and where you're going and take you back to the city and let you go. If you don't cooperate with us, if you don't agree this evening, right now, to cooperate with us, we'll probably put a round through your head and take you out and bury you in the same area with buried Mike. They tell her that she will need to write some letters to Mike's foster brother telling this guy some bullshit story about how they have moved. And then he ended this speech by telling her why they're doing this. We are just worried about ourselves. Selfish bastards, maybe. You'll probably think of worse names for us in the next four weeks. But that's where it's at. In the last 24 hours, we've been tired, nervous, a little high-strung, perhaps... We expect you to do something about that. Believe me, we both need it. If you go along with us, cooperate with us, we'll be as nice as we can to you, within the limits of keeping you prisoner. If you don't go along with us, we'll probably take you into the bed, tie you down, rape you, shoot you, and bury you. Sorry, lady, time's up. Make your choice. From then on, this tape will showcase Leonard guiding her to take her clothes off. There are pages in this book where they are explaining to her that she will be going into the shower with Charlie now, and then Charlie sort of mumbling in the background, sometimes more audibly, meaning that he was behind the camera as well. In the next few days, he would get her to write letters to the boss saying that she has taken leave, and to her family saying that she and Mike have moved. And the police will later find two more, what they called, episodes recording the last few days of Kathleen's life. As you might have guessed, Kathleen won't live for other 30 days. That is just something that they have scripted down in order to make their victims more compliant. Now, if you are the OG listener of the podcast and of this channel, you will know that I have covered toy box killer, or if you're just simply into true crime and a disturbed human being, and you know that he did something similar. So this kind of MO reminds me of a couple of people. It reminds me of toy box killer, it reminds me of Lawrence Bittaker, the ice pick killers, whoever his partner was, Bittaker was more psychopathic, and it reminds me of Gary Heidnick. They are most similar to Toy Box Killer. Toy Box Killer used his charm and managed to like switch it on in order to pick up the victims. I think he was doing it under the rules of a police officer. Then he would get them in the car and then bring them to this trailer of freaking nightmares where he would tie them to this gynecological chair and then would make them listen to this long ass tape. I think this tape was like hour and a half long of exactly everything they will go through. Bittaker and the other guy that I can't remember, they would kidnap women into vans and then they would take turns in terms of what they did with them. And Gary Heidnick had ideations of kidnapping sex slaves and then having families with them. But here in particular, I want to talk about the comparison between Toy Box Killer and this whole script that Ing and Lake have had. Because in my head, truly, why I started this whole channel, why I started this whole podcast, is to showcase this. Even in the Toy Box Killer's case, even though it was as evil and as detached from humanity, it is the human touch that these people put to these crimes that makes them evil. It is because they have given this idea of a choice 
to their victim. It is because they have included these scripts, it is because they have played those tapes, telling them exactly what will happen to them. These aren't monsters that people can't relate to. All of these people have had friends, have had relationships, have had relationships with the partners in crime that they have had. I just want that eliminated from people's minds. This separation, this line that we draw, thinking that these people do this because they are void of any common sense, that they do this because they are complete monsters, that they react on impulse as if they were animals, as if they were savages. No, they have calculated every single bit of this, and it is because they were human and implemented this humane touch. That's exactly what differentiates them from monsters. That's why they were evil. And if you aren't buying this just from my words, let's speak about the last recording that Cathy had to go through and to endure. Because this is where Leonard again tells her exactly what he is going to do with her. And he tells her that he can sense that some women are into pain, but she isn't one of those. That if she was, he wouldn't feel so guilty about resulting to his lesser impulses. And later, when he would write about these recordings in his journals, he would speak about conditioning females, getting them to the point where they would become accustomed to obeying his every command, and that this is exactly how he did it, that he spoke to them about exactly what he will do, that he in a weird way befriended them, that he would give them water when they asked to, that he kind of would take their choices into consideration, or at least would make it sound as if he was going to. And from his point of view, even though he has held Cathy for only a couple of days, he already thought that she was brainwashed due to this manner of speaking to her. After he kills Cathy, he escalates because within the same month, he decides to succumb to his obsession with the Bond family. In particular, he is obsessed with the March Aircourt family, with Brenda. Both Brenda and her husband Lonnie were kind of petrified, and they suspected that Charles Gunner, that's what Leonard Lake presented himself as in this case, was snooping around their house when they were away. Brenda actually was so paranoid about this guy that just simply seems not to take no as an answer when he asked her about taking nudes of her, that she started taping, like, different things, like, different hairs, like, by the windows and the doors, just to see if they were moved, which is super smart, just to see if somebody was in their flat when they were gone. And actually, Lonnie was heard discussing with his friends and saying that, you know, that gun practice that he is practicing in his backyard, it might be shown as useful when dealing with this neighbor of theirs, and he might need to protect his woman. And here, Lonnie definitely didn't take this as a joke, because he actually invited their friend Robin Stapley to stay with them, like, for additional protection. And in this case, we could also only speculate about what happened, but it was probably something similar to Dub's family, in terms of how these two individuals overpowered the whole family and their friend. Because by the end of that ordeal, only their intended victim, which was Brenda, would be shown in the recordings. Not me proving a point or anything, but here, again, they have a whole script that they just run through Brenda about her cooperation, but here they hold their child over her. They tell her that she isn't fit as a mother and that they have given her child away, but if she cooperates, she will be able to be reunited with her child once again. They tell her that by cooperating with them, it means that she will stay there as a prisoner, that she will work for them, wash for them, fuck for them, or she can say, no, I don't want to do that, in which case they will tie her to the bed, rape her, and take her outside to shoot her. Your choice. You could hear Charles in the background once Brenda made her choice, under inverted commas, saying that's wise, and then they walk Brenda through having a shower with Charles Ing, to which Charles can be heard in the background saying, yep, I always do that, it is luckier. In terms of what they did with these women is again open for interpretation, and a lot of it does sound like it was made worse by the process of retelling this story, 
but according to the former cellmates of one of them that we'll speak about later, they would brag about using different tools like power drill and pliers on these women, that the pliers would be used to rip off their nipples, and that the power drill would go inside of their vaginas or up their anuses, and that they would break their knuckles in the end with these vice grips that are used like as a tool to sort of like grip on the table and to like grip different tools. And I don't want to repeat what I told you about the babies and how they would break their neck. Apparently this is what Lake would do. But they could never find small baby bones on the property later, the police that is. They would only be able to find liver or one of them. They didn't seem like a grown-up liver. That seemed more like a baby liver. Which would again bring speculations about did these babies die there? Where the hell does this liver come from? Or where else did they dispose of their victims' bodies? After disposing of the Bond family, I don't have a doubt that Leonard Lake had plans and like had victims on the horizon. But this is where he kind of fucked up and I think he knew he fucked up. So the landlord of this house where the Bonds have lived well, came around to sort of see why are they behind on rent suddenly. So, like, a month later, it's like, where is my rent? And Leonard just seems to be passing by and inserts himself into this, and he says, yeah, my name is Charles Gunner, you know, I'm their neighbor. They seem to have just, like, left off. I saw them, like, you know, packing things up into a car, like, ten days ago or so. And they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. But then, probably after that, a little light bulb goes into his head, and he's like, why don't I just say this name? Like, people know me under this name. I'm using a different name here. So I need to steal somebody else's identity because now I kind of fucked up. He decides he will be using the identity of one of their victims, Robin Stapley, and just life moves on. They're now looking for a different device. Remember one of those tools that sticks to the table? Again, for their further tortures. So both Ing and him are in this supermarket, sort of just creepily observing which tools would work best with these victims. And Charles Ing, for whatever reason, because he is an addicted kleptomaniac at this point, decides to just leave the store without paying for this vice. And this is when the clerk rings the police. So Leonard Lake is here like, okay, damage control, let me pay for this. But the police was already there, and they were already lurking and expecting his Honda, sort of checking the registration number, looking at the pictures and the weapons that were inside, and what seemed to be multiple driver's licenses, multiple people's identities. At this point, Charles was running. He was lagging it. Probably to the closest airport, as we will discuss later. And Leonard now pays for this advice in a rush and sort of gets out to speak to this police officer. He's like, here's the receipt, I paid for it, so sorry, like, this friend of mine can't control his urges. And the officer is there like, mm-hmm, yeah, sure. So, what's your name, Robin Stapley? So, this Honda is registered to, like, Paul Costner, what, what is that about? What are all of these things in your car? And before he can even snap the handcuffs on Lake, Leonard Lake reaches under his collar for a well-hidden cyanide pill that he swallows and collapses on the spot. There's another account of these events that says that he has swallowed cyanide after being left alone in a police interrogation room. Everything about this story is a bit of a myth, a bit of a legend, a bit of which one sounds more dramatic. But he will be transported to the hospital. And now Leonard Lake is clinging to his dear life. Did anybody else gasp at this? Because during the first part of this story, I was like, yeah, where is he gonna find cyanide? Like, who the hell finds cyanide in this day and age? And then he, like, swallowed the pill and I was like, man, where did you find the cyanide? Why are certain parts of this story so, like, pompous and so blown out of the proportion and then we don't know the essentials? Like, where the fuck did you find the cyanide in this day and age? Okay, this isn't really this day and age, Maya. Still... 
Well, luckily the police here isn't so obsessed about where did he find the cyanide, because what they're thinking is, we have quite literally stopped this man for a stolen car and possible like identity theft. We don't know anybody that killed themselves with cyanide in the first place, but definitely not a person that has ever killed themselves over something like this. Like, this wouldn't be a cause enough for you not to want to go to jail so desperately. So they look up the next of kin, they search, like, who was, like, associated with, and they find Cricket. So they were like, trip to the mountains, let's see where they live, and boy. When they first rang Cricket, she's like, yeah, sure. So the day doesn't really suit me, but, like, if you could come tomorrow or, like, the day after, that would be perfect. And they're like, okay, so tomorrow first thing. And also, Cricket, promise, Pinky, promise, you won't go to the location, right? Okay? Pinky, Pinky promise. And Cricket's like, of course not. So, these freaking dumbasses don't go to the location. They trust this woman, Cricket, who has been with Leonard for, like, two decades. And uh, they go the next day, which, again, leads to speculation. Was Cricket on the location? Was she the one getting rid of some of this evidence within that whole gap of a day that the police has had here? And what led them to speculate even more is that now they are inspecting this bunker and sort of like its hidden areas. They discover the video recorder. And Cricket here kind of gets immediately alarmed. She's like, yeah, you can't really like go through that video camera. I think it's time for you guys to leave. But here, Detective Irene was on the spot, and she was like, yeah, I kind of suspect them for everything, for all of these families whose houses I have inspected after they have disappeared. So she notes down the serial number on this camera, and then she runs it by the system, and she realizes once they're in the police station that the camera came from the Dubs family, that it was registered once they bought it. And she's like, okay, we have the grounds for the search warrant. Now, with the search warrant, they take a completely different outlook searching for this place. They find a concealed door behind this chair, and once they bend the hinges, once they open it, they discover this passageway leading to what was labeled the living area. This room would be containing just a bed, a table with a lamp, a desk, a dresser, some shelves for food storage, some clothing and different supplies, and, of course, the copy of the collector just resting on a bookshelf. At the end of this room, there was, like, another tiny room that was not wider than three feet and six feet long. In the dark corner of this small room, there was a bucket with a roll of toilet paper, and it soon became evident to the police that this was completely soundproof and that it was probably used as somebody's cell. There was a mirror that was between this living area and this cell, and this mirror was providing a one-way view into this small cubicle. But most horrifyingly, there was a sheet of paper posted on one of the walls in this tiny cell. All in uppercase, this sheet of paper read rules. Let me read you some of them. I must always be ready to service my master. I must be clean, brushed, and made up with my cell neat. I must never speak unless spoken to. I must keep my eyes downcast. I must never show my disrespect, either verbally or silent. I must never cross my arms or legs in front of my body or clench my fists. And unless eating, I must always keep my lips parted. After finding this, the police brings in the cadaver dogs, and they find thousands of bone fragments. And it would be this day, when they brought the cadaver dogs, the third day of the search, that they will hear from the hospital that Leonard Lake died. Another one bites the dust. Another one. Another one. Another one bites the dust. Inappropriate. Inappropriate to use that special... So another one. Another one bites the dust. Listen, the legend says... Every time a Scorpio dies, ten couples stop doing it around Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Definitely a legend that didn't just come out from my mind and that you should start implementing in your lives. Don't give birth to Scorpios, goddammit. <laughs> 
another one, another one, but it's dead. Another one. Why are you so happy about one of you that I, he was not one of you? Did not accept this man. The continued police search would unveil drums containing different driver's licenses, social security cards, different bank cards, checkbooks, IDs belonging to Kathy Allen, to Mike Carroll, to Randy Jacobson, Paul Costner. Some of these bodies would still have scorched handcuffs attached to them, and some had even the gags in their mouth when they were found. And the bodies of at least 10 missing people were found on this pathway, whether it was in the chicken coop or whether it was around the bunker. The day that they found the bodies of Lonnie Bond and Scott Stapley, they also heard that Charles Ng has been caught in Canada. Now, let's catch up with where we left Charles Ng. We left him fleeing, lagging that parking lot, yeah? So, Charles, actually, was the first person to call Cricket and to inform her exactly what has happened. Cricket? Cricket, I think we need to know Cricket. I don't think you're as innocent. I, I genuinely don't. If you knew what was on that camera and you didn't send, you lived with the man, you knew all of his vices. Cricket, we need to talk. After that phone call, Charles rang his aunt, the one that lived in San Francisco, and she picked him up and brought him to the airport. And here, he yet again thought that he will be caught. He will be extradited to China. But no, none of that happened. So, he fled to Chicago, and after that, he fled to Canada. Now, in Canada, they book him for different charges of attempted murder, robbery, possession of firearms. And this is yet again when one of the weirdest things in this story happens. So, trigger warning, this is about a, an attempted suicide attempt. Just stop this video, just pause it for a second and tell me how do you think that he attempted to do this? Because I have never heard this in a single true crime story. It's cool. Now you pause it, you want to pause it? So, he soiled his pants and underpants, meaning he, urinated, he pissed himself, and then he tried to, like, wrap that around the bed, the bunk bed, and to kill himself in that way. And I was like, I just, the mindsets of these two people, this is also the moment where I tell you, you know how in the first part, when I was speaking about Leonard Lake, I could kind of, like, resonate something. I could, you know, he kind of spoke through me in certain ways. I could sort of, like, tell you where he's coming from. With Charles, I could zilch. Zilch. I don't understand his reasoning of anything, especially this. Anything from this point on. So, from this point on, I'm just gonna be telling you the story that I have read in this book, because I got nothing. No, no, nothing. After he soiled himself, the police gave him what they call baby dolls, which is this one piece overall, in order for him not to attempt something like this again. And they look through the belongings that they have seized that he has had on him. And Charles what won't surprise you with the man, because at this point he was a full-blown kleptomaniac, was that he kept what is known in the industry as trophies. They found a camera that was the possession of Robin Stapley. They found a towel that was stolen from Cliff's apartment. They found different camping equipment, different clothing, boots, knives, cooking gear, all sort of like taken from where he lived in the bunker with Lake or their victims' houses. Because the police here had the witnesses connecting him in particular to the Dubs family and to his co-workers' disappearance, Cliff's disappearance, they started questioning him on those two. And this is where Ing will say we have had a story all wrong, because yes, he would be responding to the ad in the Dubs family case, he would subdue the mother by taking her baby, yes, but then he would give sleeping pills, rather he would force the father, once he would come back from work, to take the sleeping pills, and then Lake would appear, put the father in, like, a suitcase, then load that into the truck, and then the mother and the child would follow, they would voluntarily, voluntarily, go into the car upon the false promise that if everybody complies, everybody will go out there alive because they are just going to the next ATM, to, to the next bank, to withdraw the money from their card. But 
Beyond that, when they would reach the cabin, when they would reach the ranch, it was all Leonard. Leonard was the one that killed every single one of these victims. His missing co-workers, Jeff, Gerald, and Cliff, no, he did know them. I mean, he couldn't deny that. But he just knew that they failed to show up at work. There's just simply no connection. They're like, we literally have a trophy of theirs made. But then he started saying how, I mean, he did want to move up in seniority beyond Jeff and Cliff. And to that, when he proposed that to Lake, when Lake would say, just lure them into the wilderness and kill them. And then you were the next one in line to promote, to be promoted. So now that he thinks about it, with both Jeff and Gerald, he offered them opportunities to get some extra money on the side for helping his friend Leonard Lake move. And then again, they would go to this cabin and they would be shot to the head, but it it was never Charles pulling the trigger. No, he was just standing on the side, just watching. Another thing that Lake said that he witnessed, he doesn't know much about the Kathy Allen, Mike Carroll situation, but he said Lake said that he's gonna take Kathy for a walk. So he wasn't there, like, not on the recording, not his voice. When it comes to Brenda and the Bond family, this is where the introduction of how Leonard killed the babies comes in. Because he said he isn't aware of what happened to Brenda. But again, Lake would brag of how he killed the little baby. And he just did nothing. So the investigators were, of course, pissed off with this because he wasn't confessing on anything and he was just blaming a dead man for it all. So they knew, unless they find something physically connecting Charles Zing to this case, they're not gonna have the strongest case in court. Another issue that they faced is that they wanted to extradite him to the US so that he can face the death penalty. But the first issues first, they had to place him in prison for something, just so that he is not lurking on the streets wherever he is. So in December 1985, they charge him for the assault and the robbery, and he gets to spend four and a half years behind bars. And this gives the lawyers the time to build this case. And another thing that will facilitate the prosecutors building this case was the guy that was the Sally next to Charles in jail. This guy's name was LaBurge, or that was his last name, the only thing I noted down. And he was 30 years old, and he was in jail for a 25 to life sentence. So he really wanted an out, you know, he was still young. So day by day, LaBurge would approach Charles in in the exercise yard when they would have their one hour of sunshine. He would also be exchanging these different drawings because he said, if you remember from his childhood, Charles Ng apparently has a talent for art that we need to speak about how we define talent in this case, because what the fuck is this shit? It is grim, it is morbid, but I don't see no talent. These are caricatures, my man. God, it's good that he didn't go to like pursue this, actually, I mean... It would be better if he did that and not this. But still, why is everybody calling this man a talented artist? He is literally drawing the most morbid caricatures that wouldn't be published in a freaking local comic store. LaBerge would be given this drawing of Charles Ng's infamous saying, Daddy dies, mommy cries, baby fries. He would also be described in huge detail by Charles exactly what was happening on the tapes that the police has found, describing the butterfly knife that was in the tapes, saying that he would be the one flicking it open and cutting victims' clothes off, that he would be the one going to showers with them, and that sometimes you would be able to hear him in these tapes eating rice as he would be watching Leonard Lake torture his victims. Now, Charles gets transported in this other prison, and here he starts spending all of his time in this prison library, taking all of the legal knowledge in that would become really useful to him in the upcoming decade, actually. In 1988, he faces court again. He goes to trial, facing extradition to the US for the murder charges, and this is where LaBerge testifies. 
Thanks to LaBerge's testimony, this trial leads to his extradition to the U.S., to the prison in California, and this is where most of the victims' families are. In October 1998, seven years after he was extradited from Canada, his trial would begin. And this is because he acquired all of this knowledge from these prison libraries, and he would do everything that you have seen like under the sun done in all of these true crime cases. He would be switching the lawyers. He would be looking for loopholes to fire his lawyers, to hire the new ones, to reinstate different judges, like, like dozens of defense attorney and seven judges. Meanwhile, just spending taxpayers' money. This trial would be one of the most expensive ones in history. It would cost $20 million by the end of it. During this process, the victims' families would get enraged, but also everybody thought all of the victims have been located when the police searched that property. But what would come to light in 1992 is that they had to remove this concrete slab, and apparently they didn't have a warrant for every single part of that house. So, when they removed it, they found the bones of Charles Gunner, of Lake's best friend. So now they add another victim to it, which means that Charles is just finding another loophole. Now he has to not connect himself to this one extra murder. What the prosecution team always had sort of in the back of their mind is how circumstantial this case truly is. There were no eyewitnesses, clearly identifying Charles, there were no fingerprints, there were no footprints, or even blood evidence directly placing him on the scene. There were tapes that put him in the same room with Kathy and Brenda, but the tapes would never show any murders on camera. He worked with Cliff and Jeff, but can they really prove that he was behind their deaths? They have the hearsay testimony from the jailhouse snitch, but it is still a jailhouse snitch. Can they be believed? So this is where they go to one person whose testimony might still mean something in this case. And the prosecution goes and offers Cricket a deal. And this decision will be heavily debated by everybody later because the police offered her full immunity here. And this was shit because they offered her full immunity for technically not first checking what kind of information she might be able to offer them. Because again, the only information that Cricket was really looped into was the same as the police, the same as these investigators. It was what Leonard Lake was up to. It was never what part of this Charles Ng played. There were speculations that Cricket chose this immunity because she knew she would have served some substantial time in jail. First of all, what came to light to the police and the investigators was that all of this, that location where everything was happening, was actually her family's property. So the bunker, the cell, everything was happening on the property that she would sort of reside on, on and off. And second thing was the finding of Charles Gunner's corpse, because the autopsy here determined that he might have been shot by two different people at the same time using two different guns, and that Cricket might have been the second shooter here. Finally, after some victims' family members dying, after Charles played all of the tricks in the book, in September 1998, this trial begins. And I can tell you for sure, I would not love to have been a juror on this trial. Not just because it's Charles Ng and I don't understand the human being. It's because the trial lasted for three and a half months. Imagine, Monday to Friday, you're going into a courtroom, just really listening to this. What are you really listening to? Let me tell you, while an ad plays in the background. <laughs> Something that tells you everything you need to know about Charles Ng is this line from his juror selection trial. Because he, he just really didn't like the fact that they had to transport him between jail and the courthouse, and that took hours each day, and he wasn't, like, restrained by the belt in this transportation car, so he could just, like, swing back and forth, and he would have bruises, and he was, like, so pissy and moody about this. Yeah, he was acting like a real child. 
So, during this trial, they actually had to restrain him because he told to the judge, I don't want a fucking trial, fucking judge. And they were all like, okay, we are dealing with a five-year-old. That's great. And his defense team is literally there, like, doing that Penelope Cruz gif of just, like, <laughs> massaging her temple, just being like, please don't fire us. I mean, actually, please fire us at this point, because we have to prove you are not guilty. Like, why are you acting like a five-year-old? <laughs> just repeating, like, no kill, no free, and doing, like, his like, martial arts. Also, can we... Just mention in passing how Charles Ng looked like 20 different people during this whole process, during his life. I cannot explain it, but during this research I was like, this isn't the same person in this picture, not the same Charles Ng. So just uh, to mention, because I will be overlaying pictures of him during this video, he just uh, does look like the identity theft is a joke to him. The prosecution team, led by Charlene Honaka, focused on all of the possessions from the victims that were found on Charles. Lonnie Bond's credit card, Scott Stapley's camera. All of the witness descriptions describing Charles Ng being the one that left every single crime scene. The witness testimonies testifying that Charles was the last person to see both of his co-workers. And finally, that he was in all of these videotapes. And here is when I tell you that they have played all of the videotapes that they have had in their possession in full to this jury and the victims' families that were there in the gallery. I just, I just don't know what to tell. I just can't imagine just having to endure this for like three and a half months and to go like Monday to Friday while they play and replay certain bits that correspond with the case. And that's where, again, I really suck when it comes to research to this particular part because I don't really understand the legal system and this is truly where my flaws in the research come to light when it comes to trials. But after researching so many true crime cases, I bet if he was to have discussed actually with his lawyers properly and communicated with them properly and said, okay, let's discuss a plea deal, where you offer to all of these victims, you sit them down and you say, remove the death penalty off the table, life in prison without the possibility of parole. I think that they wouldn't want to be put through all of this. I just, I don't know, again, what's in their head. I don't know if this was ever proposition to them, but I think there were solutions, like that nobody had to go through any of this trial. His defense team, on the other end, focused put all of their focus on proving that Leonard Lake was the one responsible for everything. They looked at the important thing that is usually overlooked with this case, and that is the age difference. That Lake had this fantasy for 20 years, and Charles was a three-year-old toddler in Hong Kong when Lake was even born. They actually said that Cricket, who now had the immunity, was on some of these tapes joking about the Miranda Project. And on those recordings, Charles Ng was not even in the state of California. The tapes never showed any of the murders, meaning that you can't prove that Charles was responsible for any of them. He never owned a car, he had a full-time job with Dennis Moving Company at the time, and he would have had to be driving three hours to Willsville. And, as we said, he didn't even drive. The jailhouse snitch is a career criminal. He would say anything to get out. And their strategy was pretty decent in a sense that they would put all of the women that Leonard Lake has ever dated on the stand to testify that they never even met Charles. Like, who is Charles? No, we met Charles Gunner maybe at some point in life. But we never met this man, which is also why I would not like to have been on this trial, because imagine how boring. You just have to be like, no, no, don't know him. Then the next person, no, no, don't know him. But in the end, it puts reasonable doubt in people's minds. They also pointed out that the only concrete piece of evidence is a single fingerprint that they have found of Charles Ng in the bunker, and this fingerprint was on a wine bottle. He could have just been visiting late. And they also presented Cricket's immunity, making the jury believe that she was the one that had something to hide, not their client. This is where, probably against everybody's advice, Charles Ng decides to take the stand. 
And I will put the transcript of this on the screen because it's too gruesome to even, like, I don't want YouTube to block me off this platform. But it goes into detail about what LeBurge testified to. So his defense team was basically just asking questions to get no as a response as to that everything that LeBurge has said has been a lie. And then Charlene Honaka kind of twisted that around in order to trap him, in order to get certain things that only a person that was actually present during those recordings would know, such as clicking off the handcuffs. So she kind of got him to admit that, of course, LaBerge is just lying all about it. And then she said, so how did he know about X, Y, Z things. He actually said he knew about everything that happened because his lawyer actually would bring this tape to him so that he watched it. So this is how he knew all about what was actually happening in those videos. The closing statements by both parties were kind of criticized by the public. They said that Honaka wasn't like as dramatic and as poignant as she should have been probably. That she kind of just walked people through the best evidence from the videotapes that they had and then she directed people to play those particular parts of it again. Just proving the point but also really traumatizing the jury. And at this point, she kind of dramatically held this silencer that she said was used to kill Paul Costner in order to get some reaction from the jury because Paul's wife and mom were sitting there observing, so in order to get, like, the emotional response from the audience. And she ended her closing statement by holding up the sweater that belonged to his co-worker Cliff. The prosecutor's closing statements would go through Ing's work records, emphasizing the distance between the apartment and Will's will, minimizing his presence at all of the crime scenes. And to sort of contradict prosecutor, to sort of contradict Honaka, he also whipped out this, like, prop gun and he said, you know what I'm doing. This isn't proof. It just gives you the same dramatic effect that you have seen on these videotapes. And he concluded by saying, no matter how many times you have seen these tapes during this trial, there is one thing that you never see, and that is anybody being murdered. After this exhausting trial for everybody, including us, the jury deliberated over a three-day period. They couldn't reach a conclusion whether or not Ing was responsible for Paul Costner's death, even though he has driven Costner's car for seven months after he went missing. So they found him guilty on 11 out of 12 charges. Judge Jack Ryan cleared his throat and said, it is the judgment and sentence to this court for 11 counts of murder for which the jury found you guilty. It is the order of the court that you be punished by death within the walls of San Quentin prison at a time to be set by this court. And then the writer of this book concluded, If Charles Ng is to be executed, is it for the people, for the victims' families, for justice or for retribution? For whom should he die? Among soft breezes rustling through the pines near Willsville, a visitor might hear any one of eleven muted voices whispering, Die for me. This is where we learn why the book was named Die for me. I just wanted to let you know, loop you in on that, because it's not for anything that happens in this story, which makes the book title redundant. Don't name the books like that. The book goes on to tell about one of his appeals during which the victims' families gave impact statements for about two hours. And during this appeal, his dad, Charles Ng's dad, actually came all the way to the US to testify. And he said, yes, I know I have been blamed for beating him as a child, but I did it out of love. I did it because I wanted him to become somebody. I wanted him to succeed. He said Charles Ng is his only son. If you remember, they had two daughters and they really wished for a son and that he would rather have him in jail than dead. But as of this day, Charles Ng is still on the death row and he is mainly still alive, 
because of the appeals, but also because in the state of California there were no executions since 2006, so they don't really like to kill people in freaking California. So that is primarily why. Another thing this book ends on is that at the time of the writing of the book, Ing and his attorneys were also presenting appeals against the harshness of the sentence. And this process alone can take another six years and cost another six million dollars. And yet again, because I'm not versed in law whatsoever, I don't understand why they're not looking for certain things, like not all of the bodies have been found. As I told you, they only know of 12, but they are suspecting he was involved in other 13 murders. So is there no loophole where, again, Charles could talk, could give these families closure, could tell them how their loved ones have died and tell them where to find their remains so they can bury them. And then maybe he can take life in prison. I don't know. I don't know what the family's opinions are when it comes to this case. Maybe they don't want any of this. Maybe they want him to take the death penalty. In which case, again, I don't blame them. But this amount of taxpayers' money is spent on a guy who is shown literally on tape. He's on tape. In all of them. And they still had reasonable doubt in people's minds. That is the story of Charles Ing and Leonard Lake. So, what are the conclusions? Let's go through the list of what bothers us the most. You in the comments and me, like, right here. Venting right here. Cricket bothers me a lot. Why don't we know about this woman's involvement? She was clearly involved. What kind of thing, what kind of evidence did she remove within those 24 hours? Why did she get the immunity? Another thing that bothers me is you sit on an ideology for 20 years. You sit on it for 20 years. You kill 23 people, if we are to trust the tapes and everything I have read, in order to get to two perfect Mirandas. 23 people have to die for you to get to that project in the first place. No, that is some relentless Scorpio logic that... I somehow understand. But just imagine investing that into actually something positive. He could have, because of this swingers BDSM lifestyle, he could have been like a freaking pioneer. He could have actually invested, opened up some clubs, changed the freaking nation for the better, like loosened up all of the opinions in the 70s, in the 80s, on this. He could have pioneered in that. And instead, he was just like, no, Operation Miranda, the collector could have normalized open marriages, could have normalized opening these clubs, normalized swinging, normalized just like being loose. No. Instead, it's like bunker. Survival. It wasn't even about survival in the end. That's what pains me so much. How can you be so relentless about something so wrong? And this is gonna be wild, the thing that I'm gonna say next, but had Leonard Lake survived, no one can convince me that he wouldn't have killed Charles Ing in the end, that he wouldn't have gotten rid of him, as well as everybody else in his life, his brother, his best friend. Why not his partner? If he ever suspected that Charles would snitch, he'd be dead. He'd find a way. That is it. Did anybody win in this case? No, absolutely not. At least 13 families don't have the freaking answers. And one man who is still alive won't talk. Why does anybody understand him? I mean, we know why, because he still wants for his appeals to work and for him to get a life sentence. But then again, talk. Charles Ing just doesn't make sense to me on so many levels. How is somebody less like not in school, but he's super thriving within the Marines and then also can find all of these loopholes within the law system and suddenly becomes studious and goes into library? Again, none of these two men needed to become criminals, needed to meet needed to, like, get together and just put this fantasy into action. Sometimes your fantasies, you keep them right here. When you're asleep, when you're falling asleep and that fantasy happens, keep it right here. Keep it there. Okay? Cool. Someone's a bit incensed. Someone's tits were not calm during this video. So now, I'm gonna leave you and maybe there are outtakes. I don't really know. It's probably just me screaming my head off about this case. And I should be seeing you guys next week. <laughs> oh, that would be cool if this chair moved from the cables and I just texted it.
this video like this like little chicken 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 no if you had a pet chicken respect that motherfucker don't feel it human corpses i don't think they plan to my life get out of this video they didn't plan to feed corpses to chicken they're normal they're okay in the head are you the questions <laughs> You know what I really don't feel like doing today? Talking. You know what I'm gonna do for the next eight hours of this day? Fucking talk. Okay. <laughs> Stay calm. Stay calm. Why am I so close? Okay. This is it. <laughs> Never, ever. Can you figure this out? <laughs> I feel like physically fighting one of those, or both of them, to be honest, really. <laughs> Oh, criminals deserve like a physical fucking fight. Well, one of them is dead, so I'm fighting in hell. Okay, so are you sure you don't feel like talking? Because you can kind of talk a lot for somebody who doesn't feel like it. Today is like, there's no, there's no storytelling, there's no flow. <laughs> Smile all over the place. Influencer fights, Scorpions, Lena Lane, Charles Zane, Victim, Story. Okay, you can do it. Push for it. Come on, Jeffrey, you can do it. Ojos que no men, corazón que no siente. Ojos que no men, ojos que no men. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Come on, Jeffrey, you can't do it. Um, where was I? <laughs> disclaimer, my disclaimer. It's still early in the game and you don't have it together. The themes of this video contain topics of sexual violence and all of the other morbid stuff. <laughs> Why do you, can you just put it in the script, Maya? You can put disclaimers into the script. You don't have to think of them on the spot. Because they aim good when you think of them on the spot. You know that, right? So he hired this guy, Randy, to work on this bunker to, like, you know, like, shove it. <laughs> shove it. What? Like, literally loading the boxes. You know how, like, in these TV shows, there's always a trope where they're, like, offloading something. Like, as somebody is questioning them, he's like, no kill, no frail. No gun, no fun. They're like, what? They're like, are you okay, sir? You okay? One of them is now a fugitive, while the other one is within the jail walls. Ah, I feel like sneezing. Ah, ah, ah. Sting, ah, sting. <laughs> How much different would that scene from The Office be if you just had a girl who just stuck a fucking finger into her nose? In order to prevent herself from sneezing. Okay, you good? You good? This is so charming. Everybody wants to watch this, Maya. Always. Put everything in the outtakes. No, make sure everything is there. Most disgusting fucking channel. 